Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today with Sarah Waylett. Sarah, how are you? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I've, I'm so happy. I'm glad we connected a while back and we both do a lot of work in this burnout space, as I like to call it. And I think we both wish we didn't have to, but we know that we do. So why don't you share a little bit about you and then we're going to dive into this very important conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I am what you call fresh out of corporate. <laughs> so 17 years at a Fortune 500 consulting company. And if you know, you know, right, around the the environment that that is, the upper out mentality, um, the consistent performance achievement that is demanded in that space. Um, and for a long time, or actually for most of my life, I've actually had very severe anxiety. And so... Um, Along that journey, I started to look into things like, you know, yoga and dance, and I got certified uh, through my career um, in consulting to teach mindfulness practices. And then more recently, I started to um, really facilitate more design thinking sessions and um, really got to the point in my own career that I was feeling like I needed to do something bigger, something that actually could affect individuals. <laughs> um, and I discovered that I had some skill sets that actually, when combined, were extremely catalytic. And I landed in the burnout space because I myself, I'm a true burnout overachiever. <laughs> I have definitely been burning out since I was a very, uh, at a very young age. And um, so I've used a lot of my own methodologies on myself to heal and to recover and then started to experiment with friends and family and coworkers and found the magic in now what is called Dream Garden. And that's how I landed here with you, Michael. It's an amazing story. And real quickly, before we dive into the conversation, I saw something the other day regarding, it was, uh, I might've been on Instagram. Um, it was about anxiety and I, it, it caught me by, in a way, kind of caught me by surprise, but also I kind of nodded my head. I'm like, okay, that makes a ton of sense. And it said that anxiety is your past self kind of warning you of something that they perceive as dangerous or problematic. But your current version is looking at it and saying, thank you so much for the warning. I've got this. I've got all the tools I need to deal with this now. So thank you, though, for the warning. And it was it, I'm like, wow, that's actually really impressive, an approach to deal with anxiety because anxiety and depression and burnout are you know, a, a three-headed monster that have a lot of right. similarities. And mm-hmm. sometimes when you're talking with people, they say, am I depressed or am I burned out? And it's like, well, you have to kind of flush those things out and kind of see. Yeah. You might have yeah. a degree of, of everything there, but it really depends. So the, the million-dollar question, why do you yeah. think people burn out? Oh, well, um my own personal opinion is that we do it to ourselves. I think there are a ton of external uh, cultural factors in work environments that absolutely add to that, right? The idea of overwork and the demand for overwork. But my personal definition of burnout is the unconscious act of ruining one's health through consistent overwork. And I think we do it to ourselves because we want to prove our worth. I think we don't feel good enough. We feel like we're chasing the next thing that gives us external validation. And we do that at the sacrifice of things that are important to us, but that we, and and we don't realize we're doing it until, until many times until we're in it. (laughs) Right. And we chase that goal and we chase that, right. That, 
that big block that we say, I want this thing. I want the next race. I want the promotion. I want to lead a team. I, I want to be known as an expert, right? And yes, all of those things are wonderful things, but they come with responsibility. And many times then we just keep chasing. And so I think it's, we do, a lot of times we do it to ourselves because we don't necessarily know our own boundaries. We are afraid of rejection. We are afraid of standing up for ourselves. We're perfectly happy to stand up for our teams or our employees or our customers. But like when it's me and I have to set that boundary, it's much, much harder. Right. And so I think that we a lot of times do it unconsciously to ourselves. And that's why my own definition actually brings that to bear because that's my own lived experience. And when I looked around at like really good definitions of burnout, that didn't come through. It wasn't clear. It was, you know, the WHO and the three dimensions of cynicism and exhaustion and, and you know, a lack of efficacy, that word. <laughs> But, um, and those things are workplace things, right? And then it makes it feel like it happens to us. But I think that it's very much a balance of both the perfect storm of all of those ex external factors combined with our own core foundational thought processes about like our worth, our value, right? That we have to be doing in order to be loved, accepted, right? You name it. <laughs> yeah, we're always chasing that next high in a way. Uh, when I yeah. had my burnout, it was with a healthcare organization, ironically, uh, and yeah. startup, tons of hours, wanted the clinic to be the best clinic in the community. I wanted to be recognized as a pillar. It was you know, something for you know self-worth in a way. And I felt, okay, if we don't do this, then you know I would have failed. And we don't like failing, but uh, as John Maxwell tells us, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn and you know, fail forward, figure out, okay, what can I take from this lesson? What can I take from this exercise? And with burnout, one of the things that I see, and you, you talked about it too, is in many cases, it's deeply rooted. Uh, it's things and situations and experiences that you had throughout your life that kind of build up over time. Decisions, your beliefs, your thoughts, this is how you do things. Well, that, that gets us in a lot of trouble. Is th There's only one way to do things. And there's a lot of ways to do different things and a lot of different ways to approach it. And I think the more you quit being the solo artist and get people to support you and, and help you along the way can help kind of mitigate the prolonged stress, which, you know, the World Health Organization, you know, had their definition of, of burnout, but prolonged stress turns into burnout. And if you're not addressing, it just builds up over time. And, and as you mentioned, it's the perfect storm of all of these different ingredients. Because when I think, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult for many people to kind of initially deal with their personal burnout is they're looking for a singular cause. Oh, it's work. Okay. So they leave their job and they go somewhere else, but they bring the same tool bags and habits and behaviors and patterns in their life. And then they find themselves in a short period of time in the same situation. I'm like, boy, I, I pick bad companies. Why am I doing this? Like, you, know, you got to look at the common denominator at some point, And that happens to be you. So you have to look, okay, what am I doing to create these scenarios where I am burning out or feel fatigued or wiped out or just you know unable to do the things that I want to do? And sometimes that's a difficult conversation because, again, goes back to self-worth. And, and I always tell people, you have to do whatever you have to do to make sure that you love yourself because you will never spend any more time in your life with anybody else besides you. You're always with you. And if you don't, that's just going to create a series of issues, maybe short term, maybe long term. And it, it, when I do the work with with teams and talk with individuals, it's like, okay, you know, what's your opinion of yourself? And some people are really hard on themselves, and they don't need to be. You know, we're all awesome. We're all amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can be so mean to ourselves, right? 
when we start to notice those, those, you know, little sayings, those little niggles that come from that ego voice, right? That you're not this, you're not that, right? I mean, insert whatever it is. <laughs> um, and once you start to notice that, I mean, I definitely have experienced this where I started to notice it and started to really notice how often, without even consciously understanding how often, I was telling myself, telling myself these things. And, and then once I started to notice, I was like, it's constant. It's constant. It never goes away. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to write all these down. I'm going to see what these things really are. And I started to write them down and I was like, it's all lies. It's all lies. And it's based on things that society has told me as an individual that what success looks like, right? What a good partner looks like, you know, in my case, what a good mother looks like, right? What a good leader looks like. It's all of these things, right? That, you know, come from, our parents, our family structure, society as a whole, and all of those pressures. And I know for me personally, I just took them on. I took them all on. I took them all on as my own core belief structures and then proceeded to live my life based on that foundation, right? That I needed to prove myself that I was, you know, the perfect this and the perfect that and the perfect this and the perfect that until I literally needed to go into recover from perfectionism, which was sort of the beginning of this journey, right? Where, you know, my first leave of absence from, from my consulting company was in 2007. And, you know, to go back to the anxiety, I was having panic attacks every time I went to lift the lid of my laptop. And I was at in yoga teacher training at the same time. So like, I'm having panic attacks. I call, well, I call my best friend because I think I'm dying. I mean, that makes sense, right? Like you're, I'm dying. So I'm going to call my best friend. <laughs> I mean, makes sense. You yeah. should probably call somebody else. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I think you missed dial 911. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but then I called the EAP program, right? And I got hooked up with a, with a counselor that same day. But I also went to my medical, medical doctor and, you know, my medical doctor prescribed a couple of things to help me get things under control from the panic. And I started to work with this therapist and the therapist over time, it was probably three weeks later, I had not taken the medic, I had not taken the medication. And she's like, Sarah, you need to calm down. Like in the most loving way possible. And I said to her, need to effing calm down. I am a yoga teacher. I shouldn't laugh, but I'm laughing at the irony of that. But and you are too. You you right? know it. You were you were in that moment. You look back at that now and go, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I needed to calm down. And I actually needed the medication to help me regulate my nervous system until I could figure out the other tools that I needed to have in my toolkit right? In order to do that for myself without those additive things. But that support was huge. And that moment, right, where I said what I said to her, and then I almost had like an out-of-body experience, like looking at myself and going, huh, you don't need, you don't need that, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was the very sort of first, you know, road towards Right. Like I went through a burnout recovery phase of about 90 days of a leave of absence. I've worked with a therapist the whole time. Right. I did things like, you know, just even from perfectionism, I wore shoes, like two different shoes. That was like one of the things that she challenged me to do was like put on two different shoes and wear them for the day. Just so you're uncomfortable with this not being perfect. Right. Little things that we did. <laughs> really impactful. I mean, those are stories that, you know, stick with me even now. Yeah. And it's one of those things too, where we think, and I see this time and time, and I know you do too, with the people that you work with is I'll, I'll just work harder. I'll work through this. That's not what you need to do. You need to take a, 
back in school when they said, okay, if you're on fire, stop, drop, and roll. Well, you know, hopefully you're not on fire, but you're burning with burnout. So you know, mm-hmm. the symbolism's there. It's like you need yeah. to literally stop and and take stock into what's going on and, and ask yourself questions. Okay, why is it important for you to be perfect? You know, why is it important for you to want to continue to grow and take all these online courses of coaches and things like that. I run into entrepreneurs all the time that are, well, I need my business to do this, 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 and this, this. And they have like 18 coaches at once at the same time. Like you're overwhelming yourself. Yes. You want to get to a particular point, whatever that is. That's great. You're not going to get there in one step. It, it just not going to happen. You have to build a foundation and figure out what works for you because I've got several colleagues that do similar work to me or somewhat different, and we've all taken different paths, and we're all at the levels that we're at because you know we found what worked for us. And that's the same thing with burnout is you work with people to figure out, okay, who am I? Where am I at? Where do I want to be? What do I want to change? And get clear on that because even people that are burned out, they're not even sure what they want. They know they don't want to be burned out. If at least they're reaching out to us on that, at least they're there. That's a good spot because when I was burned out, I was the last person on the planet to know it. Everybody else did. I said, oh, yeah, I was burned out. And I was like, no shit. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> we did. We, we tried did. to. We, we tried every <laughs> different right. way, but taking out a billboard and going, hey, you, you're burned out. I was just so deep into it. I couldn't see this close to my face. So, uh, and thankfully uh, for me, I had a little bit of a health scare that woke me up and decided to, okay, I need to approach things a bit differently. Um, And I did. And, you know, uh, good for me because a lot of people, unfortunately, when they have a health scare, uh, they don't make the adjustments necessary. Uh, they yeah. just continue on that path. I've seen it time and time again. My cardiologist tells me, it's like, you know, and I see it, you know, when I go into my checkups, I, I, I see the waiting room. I see who's in there and having worked in healthcare, you know, I can not as a clinician, but in there enough to kind of realize, okay, these are the people that are taking a proactive approach to improving their health. And these are the people that are hoping that the doctor will help fix them. And, my advice to people is don't rely on your doctor to fix you. Use them, of course, like in your situation with the medications that you needed That's to right. take to get you at a a more balanced state so then you could do the work to mm-hmm. you know get off of the medications and learn how to better you know, deal with things on your own through your lifestyle, beliefs, habits, all that kind of good stuff. But right. yeah. I see too many people just going in and say, fix me but they don't have accountability to fix themselves. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face in healthcare and everywhere. It's like there's personal accountability to be the best version of you. What do you need to do in order to make that happen? Yeah. And it it really is your body's, at least in my belief and experience, it's your body's cry for help, right? Those moments no matter how big or how small, right, are your body's way of saying, guess what? It's time to stop, drop, roll, put yourself out, right? Put the fire out. Um, And what I've learned about stress, right, is that stress lives on the body if we don't complete that cycle, right? So we're under chronic stress, We're consistently sort of like returning to a place of dysregulation in the nervous system. We're triggered, you know, into a stress response, fight, fight, or freeze, where literally your body can't discern whether the stressor that is coming at you is a tiger, right? Or it's a piece of paper, like a unexpected financial bill, right? our nervous systems respond in the same exact way. And if we don't actually do something to actually complete that cycle of stress, if it was the tiger, our bodies would and brains would make a decision whether we were strong enough to fight the tiger, right? Fast enough to run away 
or whether we needed to play dead so that the tiger would leave us alone, right? And the running (laughs) and the fighting and even the playing dead actually is part of the way that we complete the stress cycle. But when we get the financial bill, we don't fight, run, we might freeze, right? But we don't necessarily complete the cycle. And then what happens is all of that stress lives on in our organs and our systems. And that's how it shows up in our bodies. And at some point, our body says, enough, right? In my own case, it was severe digestive issues, um, you know, multiple infections in my small intestine, right? And it got way worse before it would get better, with, again, under the care of an integrative med- medicine doctor that could help me identify both the causes, which was basically chronic stress, not an autoimmune disorder, and and the ways that I needed to actually heal it specifically in the body, but also to heal all of my habits that were actually causing that in my own body, right? And this is my lived experience. But um, I even knowing all of the things that I knew about yoga and dance and mindfulness and the importance of you know, eating right, exercising. That's why your doctor says eat right, exercise. Exercise is the thing that completes the cycle of stress. But most of us think about then we have to go to a 90-minute yoga class or something like that. It's a long time, right? But I wasn't even completing the cycle of stress in my body. And that's how it was showing up as, you know, anxiety, overwork, perfectionism, like all of these other things since I hadn't totally changed the toolkit around in my brain that said, actually, I need to do these other things in my, you know, and make those things habits for me to be able to do that, come back to a place of calm and then be able to actually like problem solve for those stressors that were coming at me versus having a panic attack when the stressor came at me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned about, you know, I don't have time to do a 90 minute yoga session. One of the things that I do in my talks and when I'm working with teams is if the topic comes up of, I don't have enough time. And if they have an iPhone, which I call mine, or actually my brother gave me the nickname for my iPhone, an iBinky, because I'm always on it. Uh, (laughs) So feel free to use it. I'm sure Apple has a trademark. Just be careful. But um, so I, you know, I, I say, okay, let's go into screen time, please. All right. Let's see how many hours per day you're on your iBinky. And it'll it'll give you your top apps too. And could be LinkedIn, could be Instagram, could be TikTok, could be all that. And they're like, wow, you're averaging like three hours a day on TikTok. Are are you consuming like leadership, your coaching courses, or people falling on their face or what I and I'm not judging. I don't you watch what you watch. But unless you're on the treadmill or you're jogging. Well, if you're jogging, you shouldn't be looking at the screen because you're going to run into something and fall down and injure yourself because you don't want to do that. But most likely you're spending a lot of time on your phone or on Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu or the 18 other subscription services we all have. Carve out some time. And and again, that's one of the things I, I find with people that are just overwhelmed and stressed and burning out is they really don't have a good concept of how they're spending their time. It's like, yeah. get, get, get crystal clear on that. I mean, it helped. It's easy for me because my first career was public accounting and we had billable hours. So I had the timesheet. I had to track you know, all the time that I spent and made sure that I was a certain percentage of billable going back to the constant performance monitoring, <laughs> um, which great resignation. Well, it's like we don't yeah. like being watched 24-7. So um, that's why people are leaving because they want a little more autonomy. And it's like, yeah, and again... Yeah, I always I mention this a lot in my show. You know, one of my favorite bosses of all time, Rick Ehlert, who I worked with at Comscore many, many, many years ago. First day of work, it was three thirty-two in the afternoon. I remember specifically the time he came up to my cubicle, and I worked in IT for him in the Chicago office. And he he came up to my cubicle and leaned in and said, "Okay, uh, just here's a few rules for for working here." And I'm like, "Oh, here we go." And he looked at me and he says, "I don't care when you get here." I don't care when you leave. As long as you get your job done, everything's good. You've got my pager and my cell number. That's how long ago it was. Yeah. Um, let me let me know if you need anything. Um, hope you have fun working here. I was there for almost four years. Right, 
Right. In the in the dot com era, when people were getting poached constantly, you know, I, I you know my my salary doubled over a period of time because there were so many people needed for those roles. It was just like you, you get placed by the recruiter, and three months later, that recruiter is calling you again, which probably violated an agreement, and they said, "Well, how do you like your job? Well, I love it. it's great here. Well, I've got one here that pays this amount, and it's closer to where you live." You want an interview? Mm-hmm. Of course, I was younger then. I'm like, yeah, I want to build my career. Let's go. And yeah. just, you know, zigzagged around and, and broke the old school. Don't job hop. Well, now if you're at a company for a long time, people are like, what's wrong with you? You know, it, it's it's so weird how that dynamic has changed in, in HR world. And that was completely side. Let's bring it back to what we were originally talking about is you know, stressful work environments like you came from and I've worked in before and a lot of people are, a lot of issues could be resolved if there was just better trust from the leadership and the employees in clear communication on what is expected. Let's work together um, instead of this hierarchy of the boss and the employee, yeah, create an environment where the employees feel like they have ownership in the organization. Yeah. What are they going to do? They're going to deliver and they're going to take on the initiatives and they're going to come to work prepared and they're going to do a great job and they'll probably get a lot more done in less time so you don't overwhelm them. And it makes for a healthy environment. The environments that we're seeing today with the great resignation and everything else is going on is because those aren't healthy environments. They're just toxic and they've been toxic long before the pandemic. It's not something that was created after March, 2020. You know, this was going on for a long time and (laughs) in those toxic environments cause stress and people have no way to release that stress. So they don't necessarily choose the right way to do it. And it just prolongs. And then you you run in a situation and, and that's how you and I make money. So in a weird sort of way, it's like, I don't want that going away, but actually, believe me, I do. I I could find both of us. us, If we could do something, my dream is my dream to not have a job helping other people recover from burnout. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We're in the same boat on that. So, Yeah. yeah. So, so where do you see things going? I mean, and, and this is, I mean, this is like looking into a crystal ball and we don't really know the answer, but yeah. do you see, because there's obviously a lot of talk, there's more emphasis on mental health now, which is long overdue. Um, mm-hmm. There's more, there's access to everything that people could do uh, to yeah. take better care of themselves. It's just like, how do we get people to actually take action to do it? Yeah, I think that's the biggest well, question. I think that's the thing. You're right. So I think that it's there's a continuum, and I've had a lot of I've actually this week had a lot of conversations about this. Where right, right, where it's the continuum from the individual to the organization, and there's responsibility through the continuum, right? There's a responsibility of the individual to know themselves and know their boundaries, and to work on their mindset and become more self aware. There's the responsibility of the team lead. Right to hold psychological safety, safe spaces, to care, to communicate expectations, but to also communicate sort of those boundaries, right? And and to make sure that you know individuals align with those values. And then you know you step up in the organization until you're at the whole overall organization looking at sort of an overall culture, right? Continuum. Everyone has a responsibility in that continuum, and I think what I'm seeing. And I'm excited about it, by the way, (laughs) is I think with the great resignation, I think with, you know, continuing, continuing the breakdown of of stigma about talking about mental health. um, You know, we know that burnout isn't just about mental health. It's about physical health. It's emotional health. It's, you know, it's the the full gamut of well-being, right? It's not just I'm burnt out and I need to fix my head. That's not how this works. It is one of the first things we need to fix, right? Is sort of that that space, like we said, mind, mind, the mindset and the body and what's happening in the body. But there's so much more to it than that, right? Um, I think that organizations are seeing that this is an issue. I'm not sure that they really know what to do about it. I think that they check the box with a lot of, um, you know, wellness and well-being benefits, 
But the research actually says that those that are in active burnout in their organization, those wellness and well-being benefits aren't always super helpful, right? Like if you, you know, for me, I barely could pick up the phone to call an EAP. I wasn't going to navigate further to figure some other like benefit structure that was out there that could help me. I needed immediate acute help and then someone almost to like handhold me and, you know, <laughs> to, to like take my hand and say, okay, here's what you're suffering from. Here's, here's like, you know, some work that we can do from a therapist perspective, looking back, right. From the medical to like help the body and the nervous system. But then what was missing for me was what you and I offer, right. Which is this idea that like, this is a healing journey and we need to get to know the individual and, and what it is that the individual wants and how they can create routines and habits for white space to let their brain have a break and let their body have a break, complete that cycle of stress in their body, learn how to problem solve creatively for, right, those stressors that are actually causing the stress, right? And I think that organizations have a responsibility to change their cultures and their priorities around wellness, well-being, burnout, overwork. And I also think that we're seeing a lot more individuals saying, you know, excuse my French, but holy shit, I'm here. This is where I'm at. I, I'm not sure what to do about it, but I need help. And, you know, they're taking breaks. So that's the first thing. They're stopping. More people are stopping. They're, they're, you know, figuring out what self-care looks like for them. Um, whether they're able to stop that from becoming a habitual burnout cycle is questionable at this point, because I think, you know, there's still a ton of education, um, awareness and learning that needs to happen about the real ways that someone can not just stop and take the break but to actually put themselves on a journey back to well-being and then keep those habits continuously through that process and be able to come back and integrate themselves into work, right? Because work hasn't changed by the time they come back from a break. But what, are, what has changed inside of themselves that allows them to actually set the boundaries and ask for the benefits and the support that they need to actually reintegrate and then do what's right for them? as an individual, and then it's set example and communicate about it with their peers, right? Or with their leaders or, right, with the organization as a whole. So I think there's a lot of change that we have potential to see because of the movements that we see in workforce and employee rebellion, if you will, right? Like <laughs> more than ever before. Um, and even getting to ESG and thinking about the social piece of ESG, right, I think could have a big impact here. So I guess that's my rose-colored glasses. This is what I hope for, right, for the future. We're on the same page with that. And I think it's an opportunity. And I hope that uh, it will continue down the path because organizations will eventually recognize whether by just becoming aware of it and deciding to do something different or just the inability to find people to work for their organization. They're going to say, okay, what do we have to do differently? And that's, you know, the work that, you know, we both do as well is, okay, let's, let's talk with you. Let's figure out how we get this organization to be one that people will beg to work for because it's a healthy environment. Real quick, before we wrap up, a, a really good uh, friend of my brother's and I, uh, he owns handful of restaurants in the metro Detroit area. And everywhere you go, it doesn't matter if it's in Detroit or all across the country, you see help wanted signs everywhere, especially in the restaurant industry, because, and there's reasons why. I mean, it's not easy work. Customers can be complete jerks to people. And if you are one of those customers, quit doing that, please. But uh, the, a lot of restaurants have had a lot of turnover. And in Mike's situation, Mike's the, the guy that owns these restaurants. You know, my brother was talking with him not too long ago, and he's asked him, so, you know, how, how are things? Have you had a lot of turnover? And he's only lost one employee in the last three years. And unfortunately, that employee had contracted COVID and had passed away. But everybody else came back and was able to work. And he actually is doing so well that he was able to acquire another restaurant. So he's expanding. He says, I have no problem 
hiring people, I have no problem retaining them because I pay them well. They, I treat them like family. We're all in this together. We work together as a team. And I've been in his restaurants and I sit back and watch it. And I'm a systems geek. So I like seeing how things flow. And I'm looking at this going, this is amazing. And like, you know, and I know him well enough to know how he did it. He, it was simple. It's like, give everybody opportunity to shine and thrive and do what's best for them. And be there for them when they need it. And, and that's when you have a very successful organization that is expanding. So uh, it provides a great template for organizations to take a long, hard look at. So Sarah, love this conversation. We could talk for hours on this. I know we can, but, uh, but you, you've got things to do and I want to make sure to you know, be you know, aware of, of your time. So where can people find out more about you and this amazing work that you're doing? Thank you so much. So um, the website is www.dreamgarten, like kindergarten. So D-R-E-A-M-G-A-R-T-E-N.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, Sarah Waylett. So it's just LinkedIn. You can search me, Sarah Waylett. Post a lot of content there about burnout and my own stories and share. Um, and then um, also... A little bit of dance on TikTok because I am a mindfulness instructor and love to use dance as a way to get into the body. It's my favorite way. And so um, I love how much music and dance is on TikTok. And so I do some dance breaks over there as well. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll definitely all that in the show notes. So Sarah, thank awesome. you again for being you. And thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So great to, to be here. Thanks for listening to The Breakfast Leadership Show, part of The Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.